Church for the 4th of October. Uh, we're glad that you're with us and we hope you uh, find our service meaningful. Would you join me in this call to worship? The heavens are telling the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of God's hands. Day and night return endlessly, showing God's steadfast love. The sun shines upon the earth, reflecting God's light. The law of God is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of God bring wisdom, making wise the pure of heart. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of God's hands. Come, let us worship the living God. Let us worship God with our first hymn of the morning, How Great Thou Art. We were singing the first and second verses. Exciting note here on October 11th, that will be one week from today, 
there will be a uh, drive-by drop-off of food like we did the last time. Uh, when we did that last summer, we had 42 bags of food that we took to the, uh, that we had taken to the uh, food bank and uh, we would hope for the same thing again this time. So that's October the 11th from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock, a drive-by drop-off food collection. I'd like to send out a challenge to you folks to do something nice or to call someone on the phone. Uh, we are not uh, able to get close together. We are not supposed to be uh, in personal contact with one another at this time. You know all about this pandemic and what's been going on, but uh, that doesn't keep us from being concerned about others. would uh, suggest that you reach out to call someone. Call someone you know. If you've got a directory and there's someone in the church you don't know, call them. And uh, if you get a call from somebody in the church um, that you don't know, receive that call and, and fellowship back and forth together. Something else I might suggest is that you do something nice for someone. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot, doesn't cost you a lot of money, but think about something that you can proactively do that would be nice for somebody else that they might appreciate it. And uh, call someone or do something nice for someone. So that's, uh, that's just a challenge that I'm sending out to all the members of the congregation. Let's, uh, let's take a moment for prayer. Would you bow with me? Holy, gracious, and loving God, God of our universe, God of our nation, God of our lives, we pause for a moment in our busy lives to give you some time. Help us for a moment to shut out worldly cares and concerns and allow you to fill our hearts and our thoughts. It seems like every week we are overburdened with concerns. The illness that infects our world and the toll that that takes on our physical bodies, on our mental and emotional health, and on our financial well-being, those things can wear us out. The natural disasters that we witness, whether fire, flood, or storm, have had a heartbreaking, pain-inflicting effect on many victims. The human-to-human -human cruelty that has been experienced by many and witnessed by many others bears a bitter fruit, and we are tempted to cry out like the psalmist, How long, O Lord, how long? Lord, we do acknowledge that we do have many blessings. All of us can point to things for which we are thankful. For homes and families and friends, we give you thanks. Even for the things in this life that make life a little bit easier, a little more enjoyable, or a little more fun, we express to you our gratitude. We confess our shortcomings. Those times when we put self above you or self above others, forgive us our misdoings. Help us by your grace to be more attentive to your will for our lives. We raise to you our concerns for all those we know who are suffering. We ask for your healing for those who are ill. We ask for your comfort for those who are grieving. We ask for your courage for those who are afraid. And we ask for your strength for those who may be faltering. You know the needs of your people, O Lord, and we trust you to meet those needs. We lift this prayer to you in the strong name of Jesus, the Christ, who loves us, who cares for us, who provides for us, and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
see what the psalmist has for us today. I'll be reading to you the 19th Psalm. Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky is proclaiming His handiwork. One day gushes the news to the next, and one night informs another what needs to be known. Of course, there's no speech, no words. Their voices can't be heard, but their sound extends throughout the world. Their words reach the ends of the earth. God has made a tent in heaven for the sun, the sun like a groom coming out of his honeymoon suite, like a warrior. It thrills at running its course. It rises in one end of the sky, its circuit is complete at the other. Nothing escapes its heat. The Lord's instruction is perfect. Reviving one's very being, the Lord's laws are faithful, making naive people wise. The Lord's regulations are right, gladdening the heart. The Lord's commands are pure, giving light to the eyes. Honoring the Lord is correct, lasting forever. The Lord's judgments are true. All of these are righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than tons of pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, even dripping off of the honeycomb. No doubt about it. Your servant is enlightened by them. There is great reward in keeping them. But can anyone know what they've accidentally done wrong? Clear me of any unknown sin. And save your servant from willful sins. Don't let them rule me. Then I'll be completely blameless. I'll be innocent of great wrongdoing. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. At this time, it's good for us to reaffirm our faith in the things that we truly believe. I would invite you, stand where you are, and recite with me our traditional Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. next hymn of the morning is Jesus Calls Us, and we'll be singing three verses, the first, third, and the fifth.
once again, I would like to thank all those of you who have been faithfully contributing to the financial needs of the church. Uh, we do still have bills to pay, even though we are not gathered in worship. Uh, there are still things and obligations that the church has. Uh, and thank you for those of you who have been contributing. And if you have not uh, done that up to now, uh, we would uh, ask you to prayerfully consider what you might be able to do to help the church to meet its financial obligations. Let me offer this prayer to bless the whatever gifts we might receive. God of never failing love, you call us from the clouds of your glory to teach us the ways of life and death. When your people suffered from thirst, you satisfied their need with water from a rock. Receive our gifts, O oh God, that they may satisfy the needs of your people today like water from an ever-flowing stream. Receive our thanks and our praise, our industry and our love, that all might know your manifold blessings. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson for this morning comes from the book of Exodus. I'll be reading to you from the 20th chapter, the first four verses, Exodus 20, 1 through 4. Then God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever of anything in the sky above or the earth below or the waters under the earth. From Paul's epistle to the Philippians, our epistle reading this morning is from Philippians, the third chapter, looking at verse 4 through, ver through verse 14. Philippians 3, 4b, the second part of verse b through 14. If anyone else has reason to put their confidence in physical advantages, I have even more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. With respect to observing the law, I am a Pharisee. With respect to devotion to the faith, I harass the church. With respect to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. These things were my assets, but I wrote them all off as a loss for the sake of Christ. For even beyond that, I consider everything a loss in comparison with the superior value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have lost everything for him, but what I have lost, I think it was sewer trash, so that I might gain Christ and be found in him. In Christ I have a righteousness that is not my own, and that does not come from the law, but rather from the faithfulness of Christ. It is the righteousness of God that is based on faith. The righteousness that I have come, that I have, comes from knowing Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the participation in his sufferings. It includes being conformed to his death, so that I may perhaps reach the goal of the resurrection of the dead. It's not that I have already preached this goal, or have already been perfected, but I pursue it, so that I may grab hold of it, because Christ grabbed hold of me for just this purpose. Brothers and sisters, I myself don't think I've reached it, but I do this one thing. I forget about the things behind me and reach out for the things ahead of me, the goal I pursue is the prize of God's upward call in Christ Jesus. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of his holy written word. Our gospel text of this morning is a continuation of our study in the gospel of Matthew. I'll be reading this morning from the 21st chapter, the 33rd through the 46th verses. Matthew 21, 33 through 46. Jesus speaking. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. 
He put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he rented it to tenant farmers and took a trip. When it was time for harvest, he sent his servants to the tenant farmers to collect his fruit. But the tenant farmers grabbed his servants. They beat some of them, and some of them they killed. Some of them they stoned to death. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first group. They treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come on, let's kill him, and we'll have his inheritance. They grabbed him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. And when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenant farmers? They said he will totally destroy those wicked farmers and rent the vineyard to other tenant farmers who will give, them, who will give him the fruit when it's ready. Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that God's kingdom will be taken away from you and will be given to a people who produce its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be crushed, and the stone will crush the person it falls on. Now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard the parable, they knew Jesus was talking about them. They were trying to arrest him, but they feared the crowds who thought he was a prophet. Would you pray with me? Holy gracious God, may the words that I speak this day, may the thoughts we think and the feelings that we experience in this moment be acceptable in your sight. And may they all be profitable for our instruction and for our inspiration. In Christ we pray. Amen. Let's try. The gospel is indeed full of many parables. The parables are stories that Jesus told to illustrate a lesson often a lesson specifically about the kingdom of God. A few of the stories were all allegories. Um, an allegory is a thing where everything in that story represents a thing or a person. Uh, something within that story that represents specifically something else. Some see this parable as an allegory, and there's a good argument for that. The landlord is God. The vineyard is the nation of Israel, God's people. The tenant farmers were the leaders of Israel, the kings and the priests, and they were to take care of the people. And they were to produce a bountiful crop, which would be a thriving, God-fearing people. However, the kings and priests allowed the worship of false gods, and they allowed the vineyard to be non-productive, and to be corrupted. The landlord, that's God, sent his servants, those were the early prophets, to collect what was due, due the ten farmers. And that's the kings and priests. They beat and stoned to death the prophets. The same thing happened to the later prophets that were sent by God. Now the landlord, God said, I will send my son. Surely they will respect him. And at this point, Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. He knew that the current leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, as well as the legal experts and the chief priests and elders were going to have him killed. Thus, his story included the tenant farmers. Read that the, the religious and government leaders would have him killed as well. Then Jesus asked the question, When the owners of the vineyard come, what will he do to those tenant farmers? And they had to respond, He will totally destroy those wicked farmers and rent the vineyard to other tenant farmers who will give him the fruit when it's ready. Jesus goes on saying to them, Haven't you ever read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? 
the Lord has done this. And it's amazing in our eyes. He was quoting from the 118th Psalm. He said, the kingdom will be taken away and will be given to people who will produce. If you won't be faithful to what God has called upon you to do, has called upon the people of Israel to do, if you won't be faithful to that task, then God is going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to those who will be productive. He said, whoever falls on the stone will be crushed. He pointed to himself as the stone that was rejected, that would be rejected, but that was in fact the cornerstone of the kingdom of God. And he said, those people that fall on that stone will be crushed. That stone will crush those who fall on it. Now, this story isn't just about the past. This story has as much to do with us today as it did with the priests and the elders and the legal experts of Jesus' day. And the people of today could have just as much today to lose as the people did back then. Consider then the decline in church attendance, in church membership, and service in evangelism, mission, compassion, throughout North America and Western Europe, it's all declined steadily in the last few decades compared to the rise in membership, in worship, in mission, in both Africa and South America. Consider the apathy of so many of the people toward the church. Consider those boldly speaking of being atheists, not afraid of burning in hell. What we are rejecting Indeed, what we are defying is Jesus Christ himself. The decline in commitment to Jesus Christ in favor of some vague, ambiguous feeling of spirituality is rejecting the cornerstone of our faith. The risks that the same peril that Jesus warned about, whoever falls on this stone will be crushed, and the stone will crush the person that it falls on. Now perhaps the problem lies in the fact that like the priests and the elders of centuries ago, we do not cultivate the vineyards. Today we are not likely to make the vineyards productive. We do not seem to be compelled to be acting or speaking in ways that will attract other people to Jesus Christ. When was the last time you did something that really showed care or compassion towards someone from whom you expected nothing? When was the last time you saw someone hurting or in need and shared with that person some words about what Jesus had done for you? I'm convinced that the church today lacks the power and the influence in the world that it had a few decades ago. And the reason is that people lack a commitment to serving, not just the church, but serving the cause of the Lord. It's hard today. It's really hard. We don't worship together. We are hard pressed to fellowship together. We have few opportunities to do kingdom work together. So what can we do given the new reality? How can we best unite when we are to be socially distanced? One can find many moving examples of Christ-centered work in normal times. A story, if you'll permit me. Doug Nichols shares this story. While serving with Operation Mobilization in India in 1967, tuberculosis forced me into a sanitarium for several months. I sensed many weren't happy about a rich American, to them all Americans were rich, being in a free government-run sanitarium. I did not yet speak the language but I tried to give the Christian literature written in their language to the patients, doctors, and nurses, and everyone politely refused. The first few nights, I woke around 2 a.m. coughing. One morning during my coughing spell, I noticed one of the older and sicker patients across the aisle trying to get out of bed. He would sit up on the edge of the bed and try to stand, but in weakness would fall back into bed. I didn't understand what he was trying to do. He finally fell back into bed exhausted and I heard him crying softly. The next morning I realized that he had been trying to get up 
and walked to the bathroom. The stench in our ward was awful. Other patients yelled insults at the man. Angry nurses moved him roughly from side to side as they cleaned up the mess. One nurse even slapped him. The old man curled up into a ball and wept. The next night I again woke up coughing. I noticed the man across the aisle was again trying to stand. Like the night before, he fell back whimpering. I don't like bad smells, and I didn't want to become involved, but I got out of bed and went over to him. When I touched his shoulder, his eyes opened wide with fear. I smiled, put my arms under him, and picked him up. He was very light due to old age and advanced TB. I carried him to the washroom, which was just a filthy small room with a hole in the floor. I stood behind him, with my arms under his armpits as he took care of himself. After he finished, I picked him up, carried him back to his bed, and I laid him down. He kissed me on the cheek, smiled, and said something I couldn't understand. The next morning, another patient woke me and handed me a steaming cup of tea. He motioned with his hands that he wanted a tract. As the sun rose, other patients approached and indicated they also wanted the booklets I had tried to distribute before. Throughout the day, nurses, interns, and doctors asked for literature. Weeks later, an evangelist who spoke the language visited me and discovered that several had put their trust in Christ as Savior as a result of reading the literature. What did it take to reach these people with the gospel? It wasn't health the ability to speak their language, or persuasive talk. I simply took a trip to the bathroom. We never know just uh, when a word of encouragement is what will build productivity in God's vineyard. And it isn't always an act of heroism that's needed. For years, William Wilberforce pushed Britain's parliament to abolish slavery discouraged he was about to give up. His elderly friend, John Wesley, who was the founder of our faith tradition, he heard of it, and from his deathbed he called for pen and paper. With trembling hand, Wesley wrote, unless God has raised you up for this thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might till every American slavery shall vanish away before it. Wesley died six days later. But Wilberforce fought for 45 more years. And in 1833, three days before his own death, saw slavery abolished in Britain. Even the greatest ones need encouragement. Even in the chaos of life as it is right now, pay attention to the people and the issues that are around you. Watch for opportunities where you can help someone. It may be an opportunity to do something big, or it may be an opportunity to do some little thing that for someone else might be very big. Whatever your opportunity is, be committed to do what you can do to help build the kingdom of God and to make God's vineyard productive. Amen. As the days of the pandemic extended into weeks, and the weeks have extended into many, many months, we do indeed struggle with the question, God, what is it the charge that I have to keep, me personally, for you? As we reflect on that, let us sing the hymn, A Charge to Keep I Have. All four verses. <laughs>
receive this benediction. Live with the blessings of one who understands our trials and tribulations. Live with the blessings of the cornerstone of our faith.